The Princesse de Lamballe was described as proud and sensitive with a delicate, though irregular beauty. Not a wit and not one to participate in plots, she was able to amuse Marie Antoinette, but she was of a reclusive nature and preferred to spend time with the queen alone rather than to participate in high society. In this video, we are going to recreate her portraits to see how she might have looked in real life, as well as talk a little about her sad story. So if you're new to my channel, welcome. Here on Mortal Faces, I take historic portraits and recreate them to see how individuals we read about might have looked in real life. There's lots more on my channel. Subscribe for more historic recreations and let me know in the comments who you want to see in real life. Princess Marie Therese Louise of Savoy was born on September 8, 1749. She was also known as the Princesse de Lamballe. She was a member of the Italian royal house of Savoy. She was born in Turin, northern Italy. Her father headed a cadet branch of the Savoy dynasty in Italy, and her mother was a German princess. Not much is known of her childhood. So when Marie was 17 in 1766, France was still led by Louis XV. At this time, she married Louis-Alexandre de bourbon Portièvre, Prince de Lamballe. The prince was great-grandson to Louis XIV and heir to the greatest fortune in France. She became the Princesse de Lamballe upon marriage. The marriage was suggested by King Louis XV and accepted by her family, as the King of Sardinia wanted an alliance between the House of Savoy and the Royal House of France. Upon her marriage, she was introduced to the French court at the Palace of Versailles, and she made a favorable impression. The marriage was happy at first, but her husband became unfaithful after a few months, and that devastated the princess. At the age of 19 in 1768, the princess became a widow when her husband suddenly died of a venereal disease, so she inherited his fortune and became wealthy in her own right. By marriage as the Princesse de Lamballe, she had royal duties to perform, and when Marie Antoinette arrived in France in 1770, the princess was presented to Marie Antoinette. They hit it off, and she quickly gained favor of the future queen, becoming best friends. After Marie Antoinette became queen, a year later in 1775, she promoted her best friend to the position of superintendent of the queen's household, and this was the highest rank possible for a lady-in-waiting at Versailles. The position gave her an enormous salary of 50,000 crowns a year, and the office asked her to renounce it because France was in a poor economic condition and she was already extremely wealthy. However, she refused for the sake of rank that she would have all privileges or retire. The queen thus gave her the entire salary. This painted Lamballe as a greedy royal favorite However, things would soon change, as later in 1775, Lamballe would gradually be replaced by a new favorite, Yolande de Polestron, Duchesse de Polignac. The Duchesse was the opposite of Lamballe, social and outgoing, while Lamballe was more reserved. The Queen noticed this too, and unable to make them get along, swayed towards the more sociable Duchesse for amusement and pleasure. In April 1776, Ambassador Mercy reported, the Princesse de Lamballe lost much in favor. I believe she will always be well treated by the Queen, but she no longer possesses her entire confidence. She now always seemed to be in the wrong. The Princesse de Lamballe gave Marie Antoinette serenity and loyalty, while the Duchesse de Polignac gave the Queen entertainment. Marie Antoinette once commented on Lamballe, and she said she is the only woman I know who never bears a grudge. Neither hatred nor jealousy is to be found in her. Though no longer attached to Marie Antoinette's hip, the Princesse de Lamballe continued her job as a superintendent. A little more than a decade later in 1787, Lamballe's health was weak, so she went to England to take the English waters in Bath to try and recover. Her health did, and so she returned to France. When she returned, she was healthier, and it was this time that the Queen sought her attention once more. The Queen now gave her more affection again, appreciating her loyalty after the friendship between Marie Antoinette and Polignac had started to deteriorate. 
1789, on the eve of the French Revolution. The princess was on vacation in Switzerland, and when she returned to France in September, she went to nurse her father-in-law in the countryside. As a result, she missed the storming of the Bastille and the Women's March on Versailles. However, in October, when she heard that the royal family was taken to Tuileries Palace, she returned to them. The royal family entertained, more or less as usual, at the Tuileries, so the princess had to resume her duties of her office as she was not a prisoner unlike the royal family. Though the princess never really entertained by herself, she did now so she could try and gather loyal nobles to help the queen's cause. It was reportedly in the apartment of Lamballe that the queen had her political meetings with Mirabeau. Mirabeau, along with Axel von Fersen, who was the queen's supposed lover, drafted the famous Flight to Varennes escape plan. Flight to Varennes happened on June 1791, where the king and the queen and their family were to escape France. However, that was foiled. In the princess's eyes, she was not informed of the plan that night. The queen said goodnight to her and advised her to go to the country for her health. The day after, when the royal family had already departed, she received a note from Marie Antoinette who told her about the flight and told her to meet her in Brussels. So in the company of her ladies-in-waiting, she immediately visited her father-in-law in Omal, informed him of her flight, and asked him for letters of introduction. Afterwards, she departed for France and went to England, then arrived on June 26th in the Austrian Netherlands. From there, she continued to Brussels, where she met Axel von Fersen. She visited the King Gustav III of Sweden in September and also received him in October. By this time, the royal family had already been taken back and were imprisoned. During this time, her own family asked her to return to Turin in Savoy, and the queen even wrote to her telling her not to return to France. However, in October 1791, the new provisions of the constitution came into operation, and the queen had to dismiss any staff not in service, which included the princess. So she wrote a letter to her telling her the new rules, but Lamballe was so loyal, she said, I must live and die with her. In England, she wrote her will knowing that her return to France would be of mortal danger. She went anyways and arrived in November. Back beside the Queen, Lamballe resumed her duties and tried to rally more supporters, however there weren't enough. Her loyalty resumed, and in June 1792, the princess stood beside her queen when the mob stormed the Tuileries Palace and shouted insults at the royal family. And she stayed with her even when the family was put into their prison cells at the temple. It was during the September massacres that the prisons were attacked by mobs, and it would be the princess's final days. The prisoners were hastily taken to judges to either be freed or sentenced to death, and if sentenced to death, prisoners were put in a yard and killed by a mob of men, women, and children. The massacres were opposed by the staff of the prison who allowed many prisoners to escape, particularly women, and of about 200 women, only two were ultimately killed in the prison. Royal governesses, members of the royal household, ladies-in-waiting, ladies' maids, valets and nurses were freed. A princess was too famous to let go, she would be noticed, so she was brought to the tribunal and demanded to take an oath to love, liberty, and equality. She accepted, then she was demanded to swear hatred to the king and queen, which she refused. She was immediately taken to the street and killed by the mob within minutes. Some say she was raped and her breasts sliced off in addition to other bodily mutilations. However, there was nothing to indicate that she was exposed to any sexual mutilations or atrocities. Other reporters say she was first struck by a man with a pike on her head which caused her hair to fall down upon her shoulders, revealing a letter from Marie Antoinette which she had hidden in her hair. She was then wounded on the forehead, which caused her to bleed, after which she was very swiftly stabbed to death by the crowd. She was beheaded, and her head was paraded on a pike, her body was given to authorities, and she was 42 when she died on September 3rd, 
1792. And that brings us to the end of this video. So thank you for watching. Subscribe for more videos. Each of your subscriptions does help this channel grow. It allows me to continue making more content for you. Let me know in the comments who you want to see next. I do make a list of all your suggestions. And I will see you in the next one.